So today begins instruction over the CPT book. So I hope you all brought that with you. Uh, some of the books, I have a spiral uh, binder on mine. Some of these have a hard, hard binder. Um, so it's fine. As long as you have a 2019 version, you'll be able to keep up. We are getting into module three. So we are just barreling through this class right now. And we are on week 11, and it's chapters 24 and 25 in our custom textbook. I do have, I'm hoping to have a link for an ebook um, and to email that out to you guys for the procedural coding because as of now in our Online Connect course, you only have access to the ebook for the diagnosis coding. So I do have an ebook for CPT, it's just in a separate link. So I'll email that. All right, and then week 11, we are getting introduction to procedural coding and modifiers. So I'm going to open the lesson plan. There's several um, items in here for you to take a look at, particularly the videos. So there's a video on introduction to CPT coding and CPT modifiers. And I won't be showing those in class, but I do really want to encourage you to check those out outside of class sometime whenever you get a chance. Uh, videos are our best learning tools. Uh, okay, we have a PowerPoint review and our self-check review and answers worksheet is there. And we are going to go ahead and blast off. So uh, you do want to get your CPT book out in front of you. Now the procedures, this is where the money's at. All of these procedural codes have a type of monetary reimbursement value attached to them. And like in the instance of Medicare, the, the Medicare physician fee schedule that, um, is, that they update every year, uh, you can look up these codes and see even by area because each state can be different on how much they reimburse for these procedures. So we're going to be learning about office visits, how that's coded when people come in to see the doctor, how they get their reimbursement for that, anesthesia services, surgeries, uh, radiology, which is x-rays, ultrasounds, pathology, which is all of our diagnostic tests, and medicine coding, which are different diagnostic tests um, that relate to like hearing, um, heart catheterization, sleeping tests, I think acupuncture codes are in that section. So uh, that's going to be our focus from the rest of this class now on out. Um, through the semester is the CPT coding, and then we focus on this extensively in the advanced coding class. And we will be doing both ICD-10 and CPT combined when we get there. So, um, there are three CPT code sets. The one that we're working on today is uh, the current procedural terminology, or CPT. That's the HCPCS level one. And that's what that second one is, the Healthcare Common Procedural Coding System, HCPCS. That's how we pronounce that. So HCPCS are uh, durable medical equipment, um, lots of different services, lots of different drugs, uh, ambulance services, prosthetics, uh, bath chairs. Uh, and, you know, what comes to my mind is We Care Medical. That's one of our intern sites and a great employer for our program. That's the code set that they work with. They work with these HCPCS codes. Um, we don't really touch over this a whole lot, but it's not any different from what you learn with CPT or ICD-10. You use an index to look up your key term to find your code. I do hope to have my We Care Medical person come and talk to us sometime. We'll probably be doing that in the next semester. And we are going to have hopefully some other professionals uh, either join us online or I maybe get to do a recording of them talking about their career as a coder. So the HCPCS level two, that's your durable medical equipment, or as we call DME. And then the ICD-10 PCS. That is a specific procedural book for inpatient hospital services. So it is coded differently. When we're working on the CPT, we are coding in an outpatient setting. I'm just gonna double check my classroom, do a spot check. I am recording and I got my screen turned on. I said the other day I recorded a video and I didn't turn my microphone on and I was mad. <laughs> I had to redo it. Uh, so the CPT codes that we're learning about, they are five number digits. 
that's their format. There's not really um, alphabetic characters in this CPT. There are in the HickPicks. So this is the HickPicks Level 2 book. We do have these books in the library if you want to check them out. Well, there is a website called HickPicksData.com. So we learned about ICD-10 data. There is a HickPicks Data website as well that has all of these codes available. And then these are the, the inpatient procedural um, coding manual, is ICD-10 PCS. And we have some of these books. So sometime next semester, I'll probably do a, uh, a touch on this briefly. Um, it's a totally different coding system, but it's not hard to catch on to at all. Uh-huh. When we were doing, I was looking up a couple of blog posts or discussions before about job postings, and I was looking at job postings on coding. A lot of them said must have, you know, whatever for ICD-10 and 9, or it would say be familiar with 9 as well as mm -hmm. 10. And when she went to a doctor the other day, and we got our discharge sheet, it had diagnosis ICD-9, ICD-10, had two columns on there. Mm -hmm. and for everything that they did with her, they had both codes listed on the diagnosis. So I know we're not covering much of 9 or anything, nine, really. When we get out, how important is that? Uh, I mean, if you use an ICD-9 book, so the question was, uh, there are a lot of offices that do still use ICD-9. And in his um, example, they had a, a, an encounter sheet that had both an ICD-9 and ICD-10 code. Well, ICD-9 is uh, just the same as what we learn in ICD-10 as far as looking up the codes. It's the exact same process. There is an ICD-9 data website. There, we have the ICD-10 data website. There is an ICD-9 data website. I, I did an online coding internship, and that's how I did my ICD-9 coding, because it if there was a special module just for that. So I was able to look at those codes online fairly easily. Uh, it's hard to buy an ICD-9 book. Um, I don't think we even have any in the library anymore. Um, basically, that code set, just they just ran out of room. So, um, but it's not, it, it's the same process if you were to use it in the ICD-9 book, the same that we do in uh, what we did in 10. And you can look up codes online as well. So that is a good question because that is still prevalent in our area, believe it or not. Okay, I have a question. CPT, CPT, you said it's all outpatient. Uh -huh. PCS, you said PCS is only inpatient. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. So her, another question. CPT, what we're looking at right now is outpatient codes, and then the ICD-10 PCS is for inpatient stays or overnight stays. Uh, okay, so reviewing physician's notes. Um, you will look through a medical record, especially when we get into next week, we talk about office visits. An office visit is measured by how it's documented in a medical record as to what kind of reimbursement you can get. Uh, lab reports, especially if you're going to code a diagnosis as a malignant um, neoplasm, there should probably have a report. You would need a report to um, justify that. Super bills, that is a specific document specific towards a medical office. They can all look different, but they usually have on the top part a demographical information where you can put name, birth date of the patient, et cetera. And then the second half is the general codes that office uses for both diagnosis and procedures. So those are handy tools. Uh, using this procedure book is very similar to ICD-10 in that we use an index. But I find um, as I become more familiar with the layout of the book, it's easier for me just to go to direct sections and to look up procedures sometimes. But we're gonna start slow. All right, so <laughs> let's get going. <clears throat> Open your CPT book and let's turn to the table of contents. And we're going to review all of the sections of the book from the table of contents. Your table of contents should be right at the very beginning of the book. Um, there is a few pages. There's a page for place of service codes that goes on an insurance claim form. There's a cover page for the CPT. There's another page that says about CPT, AMA staff. Um, there is a, two pages on the advisory committee. And then you'll get to a page that just says contents. So first things first, we want to get familiar with the table of contents so we can identify all of the sections that we're going to be turning to. So 
So give us a minute there to get to our table. All right, so the first section is an introduction, and that's all the general information. Just like guidelines, we have an ICD-10. We do have some anatomical illustrations, and those are always helpful, especially if you do anything with a musculoskeletal system. I know the eye, the muscles of the eye are very complex. Um, an anatomical illustration is very handy for that. Uh, the next section will be evaluation and management services. We're going to talk about that next week. So these are all of your office visits. This is where you're paying for a physician's time and skill. They're not actually doing like a service per se. I mean, they can do a service in, like, in an office visit, but you know, if somebody stays in the office for a whole hour, you want to document that to get a higher level of reimbursement if they take up that much time. And there are specific rules about that documentation. These are the hardest code sets, evaluation and management. You're going to hate them. <laughs> I hated them for a long time. But I will say um, that's going to be almost 60% of your coding is going to come from that evaluation and management section. Uh, specifically, the VA, I remember we had a representative come and talk to our students, and she, she called that the bread and butter, the ICD, um, the ICD, the evaluation and management codes. Uh, the next section you'll see um, will be anesthesia guidelines. We're going to talk about that next week. Anesthesia coding is easy, so thank goodness. Uh, and then there's another section that just says anesthesia. And then you'll see it uh, broken down by anatomy, head, neck, thorax. Um, and that's how the CPT works. It's broken down by a category and then by anatomy. Uh, over on to the next page, for me at least, <laughs> I'm going to go through my contents, uh, surgery guidelines. Our surgery section is the largest section of the procedure book. So um, there's a lot of different guidelines, and we'll be going over these. Uh, it's going to seem overwhelming to get this book all at once, um, but we are going to be going over all these specific parts later in the advanced coding class as well, especially these surgery guidelines. So uh, for surgery section, underneath surgery guidelines, you'll see just surgery. There's general integumentary system, musculoskeletal system, respiratory, cardiovascular, blood and lymphatic or hemic and lymphatic, mediastinum, digestive, urinary, male genital, reproductive system, uh, intersex surgery, female genital, maternity care, endocrine, nervous, eyes, auditory system, and then that operating microscope is an add-on service, which we're going to talk all about that. Um, let's see, going on next is radiology. So radiology has um, diagnostic services, ultrasounds, radiologic guidance that's used in procedures, um, like if a person has a spinal fusion or maybe they're looking um, to have placement of a, a needle per se, they use a type of, um, it's called fluoroscopy, type of radiation, radioactive material to visualize. Mammograms, bone and joint studies, uh, nuclear medicine. And then we go on to pathology and laboratory. There's guidelines for it as well. And then for path and lab, there's organ panels. Those are a lot of tests combined into one panel. Uh, therapeutic drug assays, urinalysis chemistry, um, uh, what do they call it, autopsies come out of this section. Medicine is our next section, so it starts with medicine guidelines. And then the general medicine section, we have vaccines and toxoids. So administration of a vaccine and the toxoid itself can be two different codes. Psychiatry services are under medicine. Dialysis kidney dialysis, um, vi vis uh, exams of the eyes, the, the digestive system, acupuncture. The next section after medicine is going to say category 2 codes. And we're not going to cover this a whole lot. I do know practices that use these, and these are for research, um, like smoking cessation, the types of um, services that are provided, they, um, they just add extra additional information for tracking purposes. So I know Louisa Medical Clinic for one, uh, is one place I remember speaking to that they do these type of codes. So these are optional, 
they're, they're for research purposes. And then category three codes, you'll see a place on the table of contents for that. Those are new and emerging services that have not been FDA approved yet. And that's not a very large category. All right, then we get to our appendixes. So after category three codes, we have appendix A, modifiers. We'll be spending a lot of time getting used to these modifiers. They're tricky. Um, you're not going to know everything right off front. It's just going to come with practice. And there's not like an index. And you're probably thinking, what's a modifier? <laughs> we'll talk about that. You're probably thinking, what is that? I don't even know what that is. Uh, there's different appendixes uh, providing support information for using CPT. And then the very last thing on the in, uh, table of contents is the index. And it gives you the specific number the index starts on. And it's in the back of the book. It's a little different from ICD-10. So um, I do want you to know on the table of contents so you can locate what section we're going to be working out of. So when I say go to the index, you know what page number it starts on and you can get to there because I'm not going to assume that we all have the same page numbers on our book. Every time I do that, there's somebody like, what? Where are you at? <laughs> I'm, I'm confused here. So as it's best we get, we get to know the table of contents anyhow. So those are our sections of our procedural coding. Next week, we are going to focus on evaluation and management and anesthesia. All right, so these are some examples of codes in the different formats of CPT. Now, if we were to look up, like that first code, 51100, it's just like our ICD-10 book. We look at the top of the page. Let's go ahead and look up this code. 51100. I'll give you a moment there. I'll give you a moment to turn there. So your page numbers are, uh, the ranges are listed at the very top of the page. And we're trying to locate a specific code. So it's the same type of concept. We look up in our index for different key terms, and it gives us specific codes that we're going to then look up and verify information on. So code 51100 is an aspiration of a bladder by needle. And this is under the surgery section for the urinary system. If you look up at the top of your book, it'll show you the section and the anatomical site. So we are in the urinary system and it's focused on the bladder. I won't have us look up the category two and three codes, but just for example, uh, they end in a letter F. And if you wanted to go to this section, you could look up in your table of contents where it starts. It's not a very large section. Um, and then the category three codes are followed by a T. And again, these are emerging procedures and are not FDA approved yet. They're in the process. So we had guidelines in ICD-10. We're going to have guidelines in CPT. And this is when, when we go into advanced coding. We will spend a week on each section. We'll spend a week on integumentary system coding. We'll spend, and that, there's a lot of rules that go along with that. There's a little bit of math that you have to do too. Um, there are different guidelines. When we code uh, coronary artery bypass graphs, there is a lot of specific guidelines with that procedure. And there's a lot of specific anatomy um, information or knowledge that you need to have. I think it's fun, though. I, I, I like the challenge of um, being able to properly code these complex procedures. The guidelines are found throughout the CPT book. And we'll be focusing in on those each class section. I'll be telling you what specifically they are and what they mean to us, how we utilize them. Uh, for instance, when we talk about anesthesia next week, there are guidelines for reporting time. The time an uh, anesthesiologist provides services. There are specific ways that you count that. Um, there are uh, specific modifiers that go with anesthesia codes. So we'll be looking at all of... Let me make sure I'm not... 
We'll be looking at all of these throughout class. <laughs> okay, so, all right, so for example, I was thinking, what, what, where was I going here? The evaluation and management guidelines. Okay, go back to the table of contents of your uh, book at the front of the book. And I want you to find the section and page number for evaluation and management services guidelines. It's going to be on that very first page of the table of contents. So we are we're going back to the table of contents. Find the section evaluation and management service guidelines. For me, it says it's on page four. For you, it might be something different. But go ahead and turn to that page, and you'll notice the E&M section does have its own table of contents, which is handy. But when you turn to the first page of the Evaluation and Management Service Guidelines, it's giving you all the information pertinent to coding these types of uh, codes. So, and we're going to talk more about this. I just wanted to show you where you can locate an ex example of guidelines. Um, there's a lot to these evaluation and management codes. As you can see, it's a pretty thick section. So there's different terminologies we need to know about. We need to know what is a new and established patient. What are the rules that um, makes them new or established? Uh, what's documented in the medical record? What's a review of systems look like? What's a, uh, what is social history? What's documented in that? So that's just an example for now. Um, usually the guidelines are either at the front of a section or they're within the section itself. Don't be intimidated though, we're going to break this down piece by piece. So is this saying like they need to get your opinion If you see that, then that means it's an Well, uh, it, what you're looking at in the medical record is telling you what to look for in the medical record and how extensively something is documented is, gives you higher level of services to code. That takes a lot of practice to get used to that because um, the, the medical records broke down. Uh, you have the history of the present illness. You have family history and social history. The doctor may do an exam on you. How extensive the exam is can um, determine what level of reimbursement that you get. So it's just kind of telling you what to look for in the record. Okay, other notations that we might see in the CPT book, a plus sign. Okay, that means it's an add-on code. Let's turn to code 19281, it's on the slide there. So 19281, I want to start with that one. It's placement of breast localization device, including mammographic guidance for lesion. So it says first lesion. So I'm going to read the description again for 19281, placement of breast localization device, and it says clip, metallic pellet, wire, radioactive seeds, percutaneous, that means it was through the skin, First lesion, first lesion. Let's look at the code underneath of that, 19282. 19282, directly underneath of it, has a plus sign beside that code. So it's for each additional lesion. So if I had two or three, I would code 19281 for the first one, and then I would use that 1982 for however many additional lesions that were um, treated. That plus sign means it's always listed with another code and it's never by itself. You can never bill an add-on code by itself. And also underneath of the code 19282, it says to use in conjunction with 19281 underneath of that. So it's giving you some extra guidance that these two codes go together. And we'll see this quite a bit in the integumentary system. All right, some other notations. 
Let's look up code 27369. 27369. That code is going to have a bullet beside of it. 27369 and that means it's a brand new code. I think the CPT changes are more uh, drastic than what ICD-10 changes are. Um, the procedures go through a lot of different changes and this is managed by physicians. It's by the American Medical Association so it's very medically driven. Um, there's a lot of terminology using this but it's made by physicians for physicians. So as procedures change, they get updated or adapted, um, new codes are, are deleted or added. So that 27369 indicates that it's a new code. Now if you look at the bottom page, the very bottom of your page, you'll see a guide there. There's a triangle, there's a circle, and these are telling you what those symbols mean. So our bullet point is on there for a new code. I am going to skip us looking up the triangle code. Now a sideways triangle means that a code has revised guidelines, so that's alerting a coder that there's some changes that you may need to be aware of. Let's look up the code 36620. So 36620. And this code is moving into our cardiovascular section. And as we work through this book, you're going to become familiar like, oh, this is a 300 level number. It's the cardio section. If it's a 200 number, it's the musculoskeletal. If it's a 100 number, it's the integumentary system. So there is a logic to this layout. Now looking at code 36620, it has a circle with the dash and it's saying it can't be used with modifier 51. Now modifiers are two digit um, codes, we, we call them codes, that are added to a procedure code that explains circumstances. So, um, you know, if there's, and then in the case of modifier 51, it's multiple procedures. So when it says you can't use this um, with a modifier 51, it's saying that um, this code is a part of um, what one of the procedures that you're doing is going to cover uh, a lesser procedure. That sounds really complicated, but um, we're going to get to the modifiers. We're going to start out with some of the easy modifiers like modifier 50, which means bilateral. So if you have a knee replacement, if I have both knees and my, my, my knees replaced, um, you're not going to bill that twice you're going to bill that code once with a modifier 50 and that modifier will increase the reimbursement but it's not uh, you're not going to get paid for doing the procedure twice it doesn't work that way you've already got a patient uh, anesthetized and ready to go so it's not going to be as extensive um, you're not you're not getting that full reimbursement for that so that modifier gives you the appropriate amount of reimbursement to capture that work so that's modifier 50 all right, now we go right into modifiers. Good transition. Let's turn to Appendix A. Um, so modifiers are two character codes that add clarification or detail. Turn to your table of contents. Find the number for Appendix A modifiers, and this is listed after the Category 3 code section. And I want you to turn to Appendix A. So I'm giving us a moment to turn to Appendix A. Then there's no, like I said, there's no index to look this up. We only get familiar with this from practice. So each chapter that we cover from the procedure book, there's specific modifiers. 
for that those type of procedures that we'll be honing in on. But when you start at Appendix A, the first modifier is 22, increased procedural service. I've heard this being referred to as the Superman modifier before, and I like that um, because it's really hard to justify it to get an insurance company to pay for it. You would really have to, it, there, there has to be specific reasons, there'd have to be a report attached to it. So there's some examples in the book. Um, I think one was a morbidly obese patient, had some type of procedure, and due to the size of the patient, uh, the procedure took uh, quite a bit longer than expected. So that modifier 22 gets appended to that procedure. So it reimburses the physician for that extra time and um, skill that they had to utilize to treat that patient. Now, like I said, that one's the Superman modifier. It's very hard to get that one approved and paid for. Uh, I'm going to skip down over to 26. <coughs> A professional component modifier. These are used with radiology and pathology codes. So a lot of times, like a radiologist may just read a report. They didn't take the x-ray. That's a separate type of billing. They just get a report, and they're providing their opinion. <coughs> <coughs> so that modifier explains that, and they don't get the full reimbursement as if they were, you know, the, the, the radiology codes include the technical components of a, of a person taking the picture, the, the machine that does it, that runs it, and then that professional component of somebody reviewing it. So a radiologist could potentially do both, but a lot of times they just do that um, review and write a report. Uh, number 50, bilateral procedure. Uh, modifier 51, multiple procedures. This is common in the integumentary system. And we'll talk about this in the next few weeks. Like if you have um, cuts on your arm, several cuts, and um, you're getting um, repairs on these cuts, there's going to be that need for that modifier to explain that these are distinct procedures. Um, so multiple procedures were required. I'm not going to get all into the rest of these, but we're going to be spending our class time focusing on how these are used with codes and what scenario. So that's the spotlight. Uh, 22 we talked about. Uh, 23 is unusual anesthesia. Uh, 24, unrelated E&M service during a post-operative period. That's getting into surgery guidelines. So when you have a surgery, there's usually a 10-day window or a 90-day window where any kind of follow-up treatment pertaining to that surgery is already covered. You don't bill for it separately. It's already covered in a, the initial procedure. Uh, 25 is a separate e and service on the day of a visit. So this is with your office visits. They come in for something else. They say, oh, by the way, I come in for a yearly checkup, let's say. And I say, oh, by the way, I have this mole on my arm, and I'm worried about it. So they have to take separate time and resources. Uh, maybe they have to do a pathology test to treat that um, condition that I brought up. It's considered an, oh, by the way, modifier. So these are the CPT modifiers. Now, HCPCS has its own modifiers. Uh, I think on the very back cover of the CPT book, there are the standard HCPCS codes. So the HCPCS uh, modifiers get into specifics of the anatomy. So uh, there's HCPCS modifiers that in indicate for an upper eyelid, for a lower eyelid, for the fingers and toes, which specific finger and toe was a procedure um, completed on. Uh, specific arteries, when you're doing like a cabbage procedure. So these are in this, the HCPCS books, but the modifiers that we would be using in class should be on the back of your CPT book if you want to take a moment to look at the back of that very, I mean, it's like on the back of the very front cover for me. So um, that's handy to have that there so you don't have to use the two separate books. Um, the front page. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's on the back of the front page. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's on the back of the front page, the back of the very front cover. 
So on the back of the very front cover, they have the, the common modifiers are listed there, and it says C Appendix A. And then that second column has the HIGPICS modifiers. Anesthesia has its own type of modifiers, but we're going to cover that next class. Okay, so we're looking at an example here, and this modifier comes from CPT Appendix A, and I, we're just going to look at this. We don't need to look it up in the book. We're just going to read through the scenario. So modifier 62 indicates two surgeons. I'm just going to look at an example here. I thought, maybe not, maybe we're not. So um, the two surgeons, um, that's a personnel modifier. This is common. Um, with procedures in the musculoskeletal system, there may be two surgeons assist in like a spinal fusion surgery. How do those two, how do those two surgeons bill? If you get two claims from two different surgeons on the same patient without that modifier, it's going to be denied. If they're going to think that's an error, they're going to say that's a clerical error. There's no way that would would have happened. So that modifier is necessary to explain. The circumstance of that, that there was two surgeons, and they. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's a good example. So multiple surgery, or multiple teams in a surgery. We have to have a way to explain that. So I definitely, I would bet they had applied that modifier. Five-hour surgery, wow. Six-hour surgery. Uh, physical status modifiers. Um, we're going to look at this next week when we cover anesthesia. An anesthesiologist determines these, so that's the good news. So, it turns, you know, physical status, the P1 is a healthy person going in for anesthesia. And it gets more and more complex uh, with, when you have systemic illnesses like diabetes. Diabetes affects the entire body system. So that's going to affect how an anesthesiologist treats a patient to get them properly sedated. Um, there is, I think the highest level of P6 is for a brain dead patient that they're keeping alive to harvest organs. Because they need to be alive to harvest organs. We're going to talk more about these. Um, you do need to know the difference between an ambulatory surgical center versus a physician's office. We call this an ASC, and this is an outpatient type of surgery. I think our hospitals provide this service, like Belfont. <coughs> there was one in Barbersville that I was I was looking up. You know, ASCs in our area. Interested to know. So there are different modifiers for the ambulatory surgical centers, uh, specifically. Um, 73 and 74 that's listed here on their and Appendix A. <coughs> um, we're not going to worry too much about that one. Now, the HICPICS modifiers we have listed here, this is on the very back of the front page of your book. So we've got the fingers and toes, identifying eyelids, identifying arteries. Um, there are some personnel modifiers like a, a nurse practitioner um, assisting with anesthesia. When there's multiple modifiers, or a need to have, and there can be, there can be a need for several. There is a, a guide that you follow. So uh, services, service related monitors, modifiers are reported closest to the procedure, like a modifier 50. Uh, HICPICS modifiers are less, are, are next. So if I had two eyelids um, covered, or, or I don't know what, I had so, a bilateral procedure and uh, something completely different related to the eyelids. I don't know. Um, the, 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 no, the numerical is first, the HICPICS is second, and then personnel modifiers are third. We'll definitely be looking at examples if this were to apply. Modifiers for anesthesia are always reported next to the anesthesia procedure. When we write this out, um, there's a place in the claim form that you can put your modifiers in. And then if you do it on an electronic health record, you can, you know, there's a box you can type your modifiers in. Supplemental reports may be required, like we talked about with unusual anesthesia. So modifiers are explanation. And they clear up uh, communication. So provide, or, I'm sorry, uh, insurance company knows distinctly um, what to pay for something, how to pay for it, and not to deny it. 
All right, and with that said, let's code. Let's do some CPT coding. So first things first, I want you to find the index located at the very back of your book. You can use the table of contents if you need to. So let's get to our index at the very end. Now your CPT book probably has some tabs with it on the front page or the, the second to front page. If you want to tab your books, it's very handy to just turn to these sections directly. And we want to start by getting to the page of our index. And let's look at our first case study. Raina is admitted to the hospital and the doctor is going to perform a vaginal radical hysterectomy. And while she's in the operating room and under, under anesthesia, the doctor is going to perform an open sling operation for stress incontinence on her bladder. Okay, so uh, these are two different surgeons. Okay, so we have Dr. Thomas that did the hysterectomy, and Dr. P uh, Peters did the sling operation. So this is just a note on modifier 62 that's used when two surgeons work side by side during a procedure. So let's look at our breakdown here. Dr. Thomas performed a hysterectomy. Dr. Uh, Peters performed a sling operation. So let's start with the hysterectomy first. So in our CPT index, we are going to look up the term hysterectomy. So we look at hysterectomy and we want to go to vaginal. So a hysterectomy can be done through an, through the abdomen, through the vagina, or through a, a scope, a scope procedure. So we, we know it was a, a vaginal radical hysterectomy. So that means it removed everything on the uterus. Uh, my page is 972. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, my spelling gets me too. <laughs> All right, so hysterectomy and then vaginal, and it gives us uh, an option for radical. So when you see vaginal, there's there's several codes listed there. Underneath of that is laparoscopic, um, which is a different type of procedure. It's using a scope, and then we see radical there, and it gives us a code. 58285. So now let's go back to this code. Let's find the code 58285. Now this code, the description looks correct. Vaginal hysterectomy radical, and it says Shota type operation. So if you you might see something like that in your operative report. So it's just like ICD-10, they give you those supplemental terms and parentheses. 
So that's another way you may see it documented. Perhaps, okay. perhaps, and it might be under um, it might be under that specific name in the index. Um, but you, you know, usually if you're doing something like this, you're in a specialty. You're coding for a specialty, so you'd be familiar with those procedures. So that is the correct code for our first one for our hysterectomy. We have five eight two eight five. Okay. So now let's look at Dr. Peters. Uh, a procedure of an open sling operation for stress incontinence on the bladder. Okay, now let's go back to our index. Let's look up the term sling. So that was the type of operation. And this one's going to be interesting. We're going to have to do a little research on this one, I'm thinking. Okay, so sling operation and then stress incontinence. That's the first place that you're going to go to. That gives us codes 51992 and 57287. So that's two different codes that we need to review. Let's start with 51992. All right, so this code is indented. 51992 is indented. And that means it's a part of code 51990. So we need to go back and read code 51990. So um, what I want to hear, I've, I've got it screenshotted. Um, you, when you have a code that's indented, like 51992 is indented under 51990, how you read this is you go up to the first code and you see laparoscopy surgical and then there's a uh, what is that mark called <laughs> uh, semicolon <coughs> you read up to the semicolon so laparoscopic surgical sling operation for stress incontinence Now, okay, so laparoscopy. So one of the things I do want to point out how we read that code when it's indented. So again, you read it up to the semicolon. But here's the thing. There wasn't a scope mentioned in our scenario. Let me go back and double check it. <laughs> okay, underneath the... 992, it says for open sling, open sling operation, use the 5-7. Yes, yes. And it does say in our um, case study, he performed an open sling operation. So um, that is different from a scope. A scope is very minimally invasive. And sometimes a scope procedure has to convert to an open procedure. But we do not have a scope listed here. And where did you, it, for open sling, it's, it's under code uh, 51992. You see that note there for open string stress incontinence, use 57288. So we are getting notations just like an ICD-10. And then there's for reversal or removal, there's a different code for that. So there wasn't a mention of the scope and the operation was a part of the vaginal hysterectomy. 
So if we were to go back to the index, we see under sling operation, there is for vagina, 57287 and 57288. So, and we're going to skip that part. We already went to the, we already looked at it in the index. Okay, uh, let's look up the codes 57287 and 57288. Now, even with our notation that we just looked at, 57287, it said it was for uh, reversal or removal. So So 57287 is a removal, but 57288 is sling operation for stress incontinence. And then underneath of that code, we have a, a note there. It says for laparoscopic approach, use 51992. So this is how our scenario would be coded. We have the modifier 62 appended, and that's how we write it out. We have that CPT code and dash, and then the modifier. Not too bad. Not too bad. All right, this one will be easier. <laughs> Kenneth, he was brought to an ASC or an ambulatory surgery center. Or a bunionectomy. That's what's on the feet. So let's go back to our index and we're going to look up bunion. So you're going to actually see this under bunion repair. Underneath bunion repair, we're going to see bunionectomy. And it gives us code 28292. So now we go back to this code in our book. It's in the surgery section. 28292. This is being considered in the musculoskeletal system since it's a surgery on the foot. So let's look up 28292. And that is our correct code. When we look up 28292, it actually says correction, hallux valgus, but in parentheses, bunionectomy, with a sesamoidectomy when performed. So that's indicating it's not performed. You can still code with that. With resection of proximal phalanx base when performed. So that's if it's performed. If it wasn't performed, we can still code. That one was easy. We like that one. <laughs> 28292. You, you could put a modifier on that. Yes, that's great. Yes. Um, you could potentially have a modifier on there for the right or left foot. Absolutely. Okay, Yamil went to an ambulatory surgical center so the doctor could excise a benign cyst from the bone of her right foot's big toe. There's a lot of information in this one. 
So when we're dealing with these types of codes, we're looking at the procedure. What was the procedure here? It was an excision. Something was excised. Uh, it was a cyst that came from the bone of her big toe. Uh, I don't know where that came from. That's a runaway slide there. All right, so we're looking for a procedure of an excision of a benign cyst from the bone of the right big toe. Let's go back to our index, and we're going to find the term excision, and this one is going to be a large category. So we're going to find excision so from excision you're next going to find cyst And from cyst, you're going to find toe. All right, and it's going to say tendon slash tendon sheath 28092. It's going to give us a moment here to catch up to this in the index if needed. All right, now, was a tendon sheath mentioned? No, so this is where we can get a little confused and we may want to do some double checking. Uh, let's see for foot. And that's just up just a little ways. So for foot, we have a tendon or tendon sheath of the foot, and then it has for toe, 28108. And that matches the same one, or no, it's a different one, I'm sorry. So 28108, excision of the uh, cyst of a, from the foot from the toe. So we just have to kind of learn to go back through different places of the index to look. And you could also, I find that finding procedure codes are harder on the internet. It's easier to do that with ICD-10 data. It's harder to find procedure codes that way. But I have spent a lot of time like on message boards for coders, looking at information on procedures. So you could do a lot of research on this to find where you need to be as well. But from this place, the excision, cyst, foot, and toe, we get 28108. Now let's turn to that code and read its description. It's going to come from the musculoskeletal system, 28108. So 28108 is excision of bone cyst, phalanges of the foot, that's the toe. So that's our correct code. And in this instance, we would add a modifier T5, and T5 indicates it's the right foot great toe. So when we're getting into fires, um, we're going to be doing a lot of practice with this. And when it comes to exams, I'll tell you exactly which ones we need to focus on. Okay, so you know there's modifiers that go find. 
Yes, it's just from our experience. Yes, yes. Let's look at this scenario. The doctor performed a bilateral osteotomy of Jack's femur without fixation. So we're getting, we have some medical term here. An osteotomy had a bone incision and he didn't have any fixation. Maybe he's treating a fracture or similar injury. But we know he performed an osteotomy. So let's go back to our index. So we're looking up osteotomy. And the osteotomy was performed on the femur. And it was without fixation. So those are pins um, that they put through the skin. Uh, like with fractures, sometimes they pin a, a bone into place for it to heal better. This was done without fixation. And that gives us a good range, 27448 to 27450. So there's probably only like two or three codes in this range. Yes, yes, yes. It, it could, um, or, there, or there could be a 27449 in there as well. But from here, we're going to go to 27448 and again reviewing the range. So we are still in the musculoskeletal system. So there's only two codes. I'm going to give us another minute or so so you can get there. We're looking at 27448. And 27448 is correct. It is without fixation. The code that's underneath of that one is simply with fixation. And then there is a note underneath of that, underneath both codes, to report a bilateral procedure, uh, add with modifier 50. So this was on one femur, it wasn't on both, or was it on both? It was bilateral, okay. So, okay, I perform, performed bilateral. Whew, and we add our 50 on there. Okay. It's just, um, it, it, it could have been deleted. It probably something happened to it. It probably was deleted. And um, they just didn't want to add another in its place. <laughs> uh, if it was on the right femur, you could do RT modifier or LT. Yeah, yeah you can specify right or left. Yes, yes, and that's important for ICD-10 coding as well, is getting that side documented. All right, so I hope this was um, not so stressful for you. Since we already had ICD-10, we kind of already have the skill or, or process that we need to do to look up these codes. So uh, our group discussion, I bumped the due date up for that for this coming Wednesday. There is a check-in survey that is for, it uh, looks like I have November 13th on this. So I'm going to give you a little more time to get used to CPT. And then you'll give me some feedback on what you're struggling with and what we may need to spend more time covering. So now we are going to do our self-check exercises. And 
I have the, um, in our folder, our lesson plan, we have the answer guide as well. So it gives you the, uh, what I call the breadcrumbs of what you need to find in the index. And that's it. We have our review and quiz and our group discussion for next week. And we're continuing on. We're going to start with the evaluation of management codes and anesthesia. So I hope you all have a great week. I'm going to stop my recording now.